Luke chapter 9. For those of you who haven't been here during this series, I like to preach through books of the Bible, and so we're proceeding through Luke. We've been in Luke a little over a year now. I just realized how long it's been, but we're in chapter 9, hoping to finish up. There's probably been seven or eight sermons, maybe ten, that have come from this one chapter because it's so rich with the life of Jesus and what he taught his disciples as they walked together, lived together 24-7 over the three and a half years of his ministry on this earth. It's so rich, and I want to be a disciple this morning. I think we all are disciples. We're all at different points of our discipleship journey, and what I've been preaching, what I've been having the Lord place on my heart is that this will take us into this journey deeper and in and, and greater measure so that we can follow Jesus just as his original disciples did. There's really no difference. There's a cultural difference. There's a timing difference, but it's still following Jesus step by step, day by day, listening to him and taking him everywhere we go, letting him take us wherever we go. We're never without him. Without him, how lost we would be. What an appropriate song to sing this morning. Without him, I would surely fail. Without him, I would be hopeless like a ship without a sail. And I want us to look into the scriptures today and hear from the word of God. I have quite a passage of scripture that I wanted to cover, but there's some uh, just short shots, if you will, before we get into the main part of the scripture that I want to preach to you today. So I'm going to skip around this a little bit in Luke chapter 9. If you're looking at the scriptures, you may want to begin with me in verse... 44 is where we're going to start today. We're going to see a couple of little things that happened, and it's going to segue into the main part of the passage, and we'll preach when we get there. Uh, verse 44, he says, um, Jesus is again predicting his death to the disciples. Over and over, he would tell them sometimes in veiled terms to get them ready for what was about to come because he was probably about halfway through his ministry here of three and a half years and he was trying to prepare their hearts on and on so that they would understand that this is not going to be easy. This is not going to end well in men's terms because Jesus came not to be lauded as a king or installed as the new Messiah of Israel who would chase off the Romans. That's what they were expecting. Jesus came to suffer. Jesus came to give himself as the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world to give himself a sacrifice for us. Jesus was the sacrifice and a lot of things had to happen before he would be exalted to the right hand of God. Jesus knew this. He knew full well why he had come, what was ahead of him, and he was preparing his disciples for that day. It says in verse 43, I'll start, and they were all amazed at the majesty of God, but while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus said, he said this to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears for the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. He, they heard just enough to really scare them. And he said he, he wanted to let them know but it's been hidden from them. Their eyes have not yet been opened to how this thing is going to go. And then interestingly, our egos rise up and two of the disciples got in a little side argument. Which one of us is going to be greatest when Jesus is exalted? Which one of you is going to be his right hand man? I think it might be me. No, I think it might be me. Had this little childish kind of argument going on. A dispute rose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him. And he said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, him who sent, receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. He said, you've got to become like a little child to enter my kingdom. He was looking for humility. He was looking for grace. He was looking for them to lay themselves before him as servants. And they were arguing over who's going to be the greatest. He said, unless you become like a little child, you won't have any part of this kingdom. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him for he who is not against us is on our side. They didn't like that people were doing the works of Jesus except for them. They thought they had a lock on it. They thought they had the exclusive rights to do these things that Jesus had been teaching them. But Jesus had all along sought to replicate his kingdom. 
He taught these things to masses of people. People witnessed Him. And there were more than just the 12 people who saw these things and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to work and do the same things that Jesus was doing. And Jesus was happy with it. Jesus said, if they're not against us, they're for us. And the disciples began to grow a little bit jealous over that. Now, uh, then it goes on to talk about a Samaritan village rejects the Savior. Now, it came to pass when the time had come for Him to be received up that He steadfastly set His face to go toward Jerusalem. That's where I want to begin a little bit more preaching. Nothing would stop Jesus. He said, I will go to Jerusalem. Now this wasn't his final approach to Jerusalem where he would die, but this is where his ministry would take on a completely different tenor and a completely different emphasis, and he would become more well-known. His miracles would be more well-publicized, and the controversy surrounding Jesus would be heated up. This is when things would go into full gear, high gear. He's talking to his fellows today, and he said, you're going to have to expect opposition. Prepare it. Train for it. And that's what he calls to us today. If we're walking with Jesus, we're going to see opposition in this world. I think we said it last week. If we're running with the devil, we're running in the same direction. Of the if we're not butting heads with the devil, we're probably running in the same direction. And that's the way it works in this world because if we follow Jesus... If we follow after God and we are in the Scriptures and we're immersing ourselves in the kingdom of God, we're going to oppose the kingdoms of this world. And the devil is not going to be happy. The world system will not accept us. You will need to prepare for opposition. You see, the disciples had seen somebody out there doing their job, casting out demons, and they said they were posers. And Jesus said, let them go. Whoever is not against us is for us. Number two, the kingdom of God is designed to grow. The kingdom of God is not to stay static, not to stay the same, not status quo. It's growing. The kingdom of God grows wherever Jesus is and wherever His Word is preached, wherever the Holy Spirit moves and, and does the works of the kingdom. The kingdom of God will grow. It will spread and the works will follow. The good works, the works of the kingdom will follow. He has taught us, He has given us the gifts of the Spirit he has given us the ability to do the works that He's called us to do. He equips us wherever He sends us. He doesn't send us out destitute or half cock. Jesus gives us power as His church, dear friends. He calls us to receive that power today, and that power is by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost to give the church power to bring, the Bible calls Him the Comforter, the Parakletos in Greek. The Comforter will come, and He will lead you into all truth. Oh, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our guide. He's our counselor. He's the one who comes to us and leads us into the Scriptures, into truth. He leads us into situations where we face battle, where we face opposition in this world. And Jesus has sent Him so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. The kingdom of God will grow. The kingdom of God will spread. Do we hate those who oppose us? That's what the Bible talks about here. Um, the disciples were worried about these guys who were doing the works of Jesus without asking them or without acknowledging them and just going off. They thought they were rogues that they were out doing their own thing. And they had this opposition rise up in their hearts. But there was also this case of Samaria. Samaria was a region to the north of Israel. And I don't know if you know the whole story, but Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Oh, they despised each other, and it was a clear-cut case of racism. It was They hated Samaritans just because of who they were, and Samaritans hated Jews just because of who they were. And it went back hundreds and hundreds of years, back to the Babylonian exile, when King Nebuchadnezzar uh, took in, in captive all the best and the brightest of the Jews from the northern kingdom, from the southern kingdom, actually, and he took them in captive to Babylonia, and... During that time, there were some people who were left over and they began to intermarry with cultures from around them. So the Jews actually, and this is a terrible term, considered them half-breeds. That was exactly what they considered the Samaritans. They weren't true Jews. And the Samaritans had actually established their own brand of Judaism. They worshipped on a place called Mount Gerizim, had built their own temple. And it was a competing sort of religion with Judaism and it caused a lot of, of, of hatred and a lot of, of trouble between the two groups groups of people. Well, Jesus loves Samaritans. 
Jesus was called to speak to the Samaritans and real good, solid Jews did not even want to go through Samaria. Even when it was productive to do so, when it was a shortcut, they would go all the way around to avoid going through Samaria. Well, Jesus had planned to go down to the temple at Jerusalem to worship and he sent an advanced team ahead of him to see what things were like in Samaria because people in those days, it was a three days journey and they were completely dependent on hospitality. People would have to help them along the way, feed them. It was actually a part of Jewish law where they were required to take in strangers because people would perish on the way unless they had the hospitality of strangers. Well, the advanced team came back and said, they don't want us there. They don't want us there, Jesus. They don't like the fact that we're coming to the temple in Jerusalem, cutting through their land. And so they said, we don't want us there. There was a hostility there. And Peter and James and John were Jesus' inner circle, but this was James and John. And the Bible calls them the sons of thunder. They were brothers. The sons of thunder probably means they had a bad temper, I believe. They had a, a rough side. And they, they had this bright idea. They said, Jesus, what we ought to do? He said, let's just call down some fire from heaven and burn those folks up. Let's just burn them up. Now that sounds rough, but that's what it says in the scripture. He said, let's burn him up. Call down fire from heaven. Can you imagine the eye roll that Jesus must have said? I bet if he, if he Jesus didn't wear glasses, but he probably, if he did, he would have taken them off and said, what? What? Call down fire from heaven. What are you talking about? Have I not taught you anything? Jesus was absolutely, I'm sure, in a righteous, holy way, livid with them for even suggesting such a thing. Jesus loved people. Jesus loved the Samaritans. He, he rebuked James and John, it says. Or, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, James and John. He rebuked them soundly. Rebuked them soundly when they asked him to burn the people down. Their egos were out of control. Anger was being manifested. It went against everything that Jesus had been trying to teach them. So I ask myself this question, do we hate those who oppose us? It's awful easy to mark people in this world, the world system. All we see going on in our world today with the culture that comes against us and, and that defies the word of God, that has no love for the scriptures, that does not recognize God as the authority in our lives. I'm talking about all that's going on, the woke culture and the things that we see that's just absolutely repugnant to us as Christians, but does it cause us to hate people? And I have to watch myself sometimes because I get angry. When I watch on TV and I see what's going on, I get angry. I see what's happening in the culture, I get angry. And then I have to remember that God has not called me to be angry with people. God has called me to love people. God has called me to pray for those people. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Pray for those who are lost. Oh, my dear friends, it is a sad, sad thing when people turn their back on God. When God has done so much to reveal himself and when the culture turns against God, a godless culture rises up. It's sad. Let us pray. Let's get on our knees and pray for this country. We don't like the direction some things are going. Oh, it hurts us. It breaks our heart to see what's happening with children, what's happening in our schools, what's happening in uh, all facets of society and politics. It breaks our hearts when not to get angry. God does not call us to, to get mean and to get violent or to uh, rise up in anger. God said, get on your knees. Jesus said, pray for those who spitefully use you. Pray for your enemies. Love them. And that's hard. Oh, is that hard? Oh, it's so hard. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. Anything Jesus calls us to do is not going to be easy. But we've got to do it. We've got to do things His way. There is a cost of following Jesus. And now here's where I want to really hit the sermon hard. That's all the backup material. I want to call this next section, Hands on the Plow. Hands on the Plow. There's a cost to following Jesus. Jesus calls us, dear friends, to count the cost and order our priorities as we answer His holy calling. There is a cost that we must pay for following Jesus. Here's the scripture that I would like to use as the main text today. Verse 57 says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay His head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service 
of the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Dear friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. God. Help us, Lord. Show us this in its, uh, what you want us to hear, Lord. I pray that you would embed it deeply in our hearts. Give us revelation and utterance, I pray now in Jesus' name. I thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. He says, first of all, the first point I have is hitting the road. The work is out there, dear friends. He says, you can't just sit on your, on your uh, home base. You can't just sit and do the works of the kingdom of God. The work is out there. The work is outside. We come to church and we love each other. We worship together. But the real work is out there. The real work is out there. We, we can't ignore the world around us. We can't ignore it. Jesus said, are you willing to count the cost? Are you willing to do what I do? He says, foxes have their holes and uh, birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Well, it's interesting because a lot of people will say, well, listen, poor Jesus. Poor Jesus was homeless. And I've heard Jesus characterized as a homeless person, like a beggar, like we would think of it, holds up a sign, please help, and, and no food, and depended on uh, everybody to give him meals. That's not who Jesus was at all. Jesus was well cared for. Jesus had a thriving ministry with 12 men who had left their businesses and their families. They were all well supported. We're documented in the scriptures where people actually supported his ministry. And I don't believe that Jesus lived a lavish lifestyle in any sort of way, but every need he had was met. Jesus didn't have to beg for food. He wasn't homeless in the classical sense that we define homelessness. But Jesus did not have a stationary place to stay. Some scriptures indicate that he may have had a house. It may have been the house that had belonged to Mary and Joseph. He had possibly inherited it, and, but he wasn't there much. Jesus was not home much because his job, his ministry was on the road. What could you imagine if I told you I want to give you a good job, the best job you've ever had? This job's going to pay the best money you've ever made and it will prepare you for even greater things. You got to pack your bag right now, be at the airport in two hours, and you'll have a ticket waiting on you to fly to the other side of the world. And after you're done there, we're going to fly you to the other side of the world. We're going to keep you on the road constantly. Do you want to accept that job? You have to think about it. You have to think about it. The job is out there. I'll never be home. The job will keep me on the move at all times. I'll have to leave my friends behind. I can call them. I can talk with them. I'll be home sometimes, maybe at holidays. But as far as day-to-day -day life, it's going to change everything. I believe that's what Jesus was saying to the disciples. Following me is going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a cakewalk. You're going to have to leave your home. You're going to have to be out here and do the works of the kingdom with me. Are you willing to accept it? Entertainers do it all the time. Professional athletes stay on the road all the time. You know, I know a lot of salesmen who stay on the road all the time. Technicians who work on equipment all over the world stay on an airplane most of their lives. You sacrifice your creature comforts for what you consider to be a higher purpose, either a job or an opportunity of some sort. And Jesus was saying, you're going to have to sacrifice your comfort, your comfort zone for my kingdom. I'm calling you to a higher standard, to a higher place, because Jesus' job was on the road, and he must be the priority, not just an option. He said, follow me. He's talking to another fellow, and uh, he said, follow me. He was offering for this guy to come and follow him. Wherever he goes, whatever he does, follow him. That disciple that he would choose would have to give up the creature comforts of this life and living a simple life and have to go on the road with Jesus. It could be daunting. It could be a, a major lifestyle change. But this guy had a different kind of excuse. He said, let me just go back and bury my daddy. Let me just go back. Jesus, i got to go bury my daddy. Well, his daddy was still alive. A lot of people I've heard say before, well, that sounds kind of mean that Jesus wouldn't even let him go have a funeral for his daddy. His daddy wasn't dead. He didn't need a funeral. What he was saying was he said, I'm going to go back and spend years until my daddy dies, until my family is you know, gone and I'm, I'm going to go take care of them. Then maybe if I have any time left over, Jesus, I'll come follow you. doesn't work that way. Jesus doesn't need our leftovers. Jesus doesn't need our spare time. Jesus wants to be our priority. He's calling us to the kingdom of God. It doesn't work for us to work Jesus into our lives. He wants us to make him our priority. Let me go and bury my father first, Jesus. He said, let the spiritually dead bury the dead. Actually, he said, let the dead bury the dead, but inferred strongly is the spiritually dead. 
In other words, let society take care of itself. Your family will take care of itself. Come and follow me. But the guy just could not make the commitment. The third one, he said, I want to hang with my family. I want to stay with my family. Let me go take care of my family, Lord. And we know that Jesus loves families. Jesus has called us to take care of our families. But our family can also become an idol in our lives. I've seen times when people refuse the call of God because they wanted to stay close to their family. And I love my family. I love staying close to my family. And I live close to my parents as long as they live. And God had called me and He equipped me to live right there. But I had to come to a point in my life where I would give that to Jesus. Where I would say, I'll follow you no matter what it takes, Lord. No matter what it takes. He's calling us to make Him a priority in our lives, not just an option. And Jesus can't deal with just half of us or a part of us. Say, well, Jesus, you can have this part of my life, but I want to keep this part over here. He's calling us to give it all. He's calling His disciples to give it all. He goes on to talk about plowing a field. Plowing a field. I've got a bluegrass banjo player over here who taught me a song just recently called the Keep Your Hands on the Plow of God. I might get you to play that at the end of the service. Will you play it for me? Sure. Keep your hands on the plow of God. An old bluegrass tune where, uh, did that come from the slave fields? Didn't they used to sing uh, yeah, that? Yeah, it it's an old African-American spiritual. Right, right. An old African-American spiritual. Keep your hands on the plow of God comes from this scripture right here. And I call this point, plow my field. He says, don't be distracted by what's there, back there. Be focused on what's ahead of you. Be focused on the job that I've given you to do. The plowing. Anybody ever plowed a mule in here? Larry, did you ever plow a mule? Mr. Clarence, you plowed a mule. Now, I've never plowed a mule. I've seen it done as a novelty, but I've never never plowed a mule. How many ever driven a tractor and, and plowed a field and, and dug furrows? Can you keep it straight? Can you put straight furrows, Craig? You keep it straight? That's hard, isn't it? That's hard. Mr. Clarence, how was it with a mule? It was hard. It was hard. <laughs> and not only did you have to uh, to uh, worry about keeping the first straight, you had to keep the mule straight too, didn't you? Mm -hmm. and he, what did you do when he misbehaved? Well, he did pretty good, you know. Got him trained. They kind of follow the road. Yeah, they kind of know what they're doing. <laughs> I was reading this scripture and it talks about when you put your hand to the plow. Jesus said, if you put your hands to the plow and you start looking back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. You're not fit for the kingdom of God. He was using an agricultural metaphor that they were all familiar with. They were all farmers and they all worked in farming. They knew exactly what he was talking about because you've got to keep your eyes straight ahead, don't you? To keep that thing straight. I've got a little plow, a little rototiller at home, and I can't do a straight row with that. I'll plow up my little patch and it'll be all over the place. And I don't know how to keep it straight, but I read some things that big farmers that use big tractors, they use basically like a gun sight. They'll keep their gun sight on a uh, uh, object in the way distance and they can keep it pretty straight. They even use GPS nowadays to keep those rows perfectly straight. When you see a beautifully plowed field, it's like a work of art. It's beautiful to see, especially when you see an aerial view, perfectly straight rows, using every bit of space to the maximum efficiency. That's what Jesus is likening unto his fields. It's what he's doing in this earth. And when we put our hands to the plow, if we're distracted by family or by stuff or by money or by jobs, whatever it may be, we're doing this. We've got our hands on the plow, but we're, we're distracted here. I thought about it in a modern, modern text. What if a man was trying to plow and text at the same time? Texting people. We see a lot of people driving and texting, don't we? Texting and trying to talk on the phone and, and trying to solve problems at home while he's plowing a mule. It's not ever going to work. You're going to get done and that plow field is going to be a big mess. It's going to be a, a just jumbled up mess. It's not going to be worth anything. You're going to have to start over. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. The plowman who does not bend attentively to his work goes crooked. A plowman strives to run a straight furrow. Looking to the things behind is fatal to a straight furrow. He then is not suited or adapted to plowing. This exchange was a case of a divided mind. That comes from A.T. Robertson, a Greek scholar that I read extensively. In farming, the plowing is the act of breaking up the ground before planting seeds. Spiritually, plowing can mean digging up the ground of one's life to let new things flourish. This can include getting out of the deep areas of one's life things such as fear, and worries and lack of trust. Way back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 4.39 says, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground 
and do not sow among thorns. The book of Hosea the prophet 10, 12 says, sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of the unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. Often in the scriptures, a, a plow field is likened to our lives. Jesus wants to break up the, the hard parts of our lives. He wants us to be instruments of grace and mercy and love and what, as if we were shepherding a plow through a field, as if we were plowing furrows, straight furrows. And he says, keep your eyes on the prize, dear friends. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Don't look back. Don't be distracted by the things of this world. You've got to break ground for there to be a harvest. Luke 10, 2, Jesus said to his people, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. There's nothing more beautiful than a perfectly plowed field. It's like a work of art. It's efficient. It's productive. It does what it's supposed to do. It's the very best use of land and resources in straight lines are what we need. Straight lines are hard to do. The prime purpose of plowing is to upturn the beautiful, loamy, perfect soil that can raise, raise the crops that are planted. And dear friends, I want you to know Jesus is calling us to plow straight. What will it take to keep us from Jesus? What will it take to keep us from heeding his call in our lives? Are there the distractions that we have? Are there things that are more important? Are there things that call to us more strongly than the Holy Spirit that we hear, things that we desire, and sometimes we even rationalize and, and we say, I want this, and sometimes we don't know what we want. Jesus is saying, follow me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You can't be divided in your attention. You keep looking back, distracted from the plow. You're dealing with your issues, and there's no way you're going to produce a beautiful field. Farming is your calling, and he has called you to plow straight. I want Sing that song for me real quick as we end. Get your banjo. I want Zach to sing that song. Keep your hands on the plow of God. And then we'll dismiss after that. and John all these prophets are dead and gone keep your hand on the plow hold on that's what the old uh, people used to sing in the plow fields I thought that would bless us today and I thank you very much Zach that was good um, let's bow our heads and close our eyes Tony would you play Lord Jesus we love you so much 
Touch our hearts, Lord Jesus. We've read your word, God. It's been a lot of information today. God, I pray that you would burn it deeply into our hearts. Lord, are we holding back something from you? I ask you that for myself, Lord. If I'm holding back anything, Lord, reveal it to me. Show me, Lord. Lord, if I put my hands to the plow and been distracted, Lord, I know I have. I've seen many things in this world that have distracted me, Lord. Many things that are actually good things and blessings that can become a complete distraction. Lord, I want to focus on you, Jesus. I want you to be my life. Lord, nothing else is going to go right in my life until you take first priority. Oh, Lord Jesus, I call to all my brothers and sisters today, Lord, to set things in order. Set things in order in our lives. Jesus calls us to have an abundant life, dear friends. He calls us to enjoy our families, to enjoy our sources, to enjoy our resources. But He must take priority in our lives. Oh, nothing's going to go right until we set our priorities, set our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our hands on the plow with our focus straight ahead on the work that He's called us to do. It's going to be different for every one of us. He's got a different call in every one of our lives. Jesus first. His kingdom must be first. Oh, I call you, dear saint of God, to reprioritize today, to let all the things of this world fall away and follow Him with your whole heart, your whole mind, your strength, everything in you, Lord Jesus. We follow you. Oh, it's a church, Lord. It's State of Methodist Church. We want you to be front and center in everything that we do, Lord. I give it to you as the pastor today. Lord, forgive me for letting other priorities creep in, Lord, for taking my eyes off the field. Forgive me, Lord. Raise us up as, as warriors for the gospel, Lord Jesus. We love you. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, Lord. Try me, O
pray. Let me just miss you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the people of God. Thank you for the fellowship that we have. Lord, I bless you. I praise you. And I pray that you would lead with us, God. Take us into the field. Keep our eyes on the field, Lord, and our hands on the plow. Blessed be your name, Jesus. We love you. I dismiss the great people of State of Methodist Church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. amen. Fellowship with each other. Enjoy each other. <laughs> Thank you, Internet friends. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week in here in church and uh, same time, same place. Love you. God bless you.